Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, my God. You, you are an amazing people. You are an amazing people. There is, I, I just feel like I'm in the room with the special forces. Absolutely. There is so much glory, anointing. You know, while I was sitting down there, I couldn't hardly worship because revelation was just flowing. And I was just writing and listening and receiving none of that would be possible without your amazing leaders and we thank God for you every time I hear him worshiping I just like uh, he just been holding out on me just amazing gifts of God and uh, my wife and I are just so honored to be here I want you to grab your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter number one, and, and we're going to read just a portion of scripture just to get it back in you, and then I'm going to share a few things with you. I'm going to try to slow down this morning, and we'll see how that works, because there's a lot I want to just just as we say in Texas, dump on you. Now, Ephesians 1, we talked about last night how this is Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus after it has been birthed, and he wants them to go on to deeper revelation in the knowledge of God. And then he says, of course, in verse number 19, where our focus is, he wants them to know, to get some, a revelation of three things. What is the hope of his calling? And what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? Not just, he doesn't want us to just get a revelation of God's exceeding greatness of his power. But rather, he says, I want you to take it a step further. I want you to get a revelation of what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward you. What does this mean to you? What is the exceeding greatness of his power, what is that toward you? That's the revelation. Not that he has it, but how is that significant for you? And then he begins to tell us what it, why it's significant. According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named not only in this world, but in that which is to come. And then chapter number two, verse number six says, and he raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places. Now, now we know why he said that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. According to the working of the mighty power which raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand. Why? Because he raised us up together. So... We're, we're going to talk about the ascension dimension part two. And maybe we'll get to the ascension in the next service. But this morning, I want to take you into something. You know, you, in Matthew chapter number 11, John the Baptist has come on the scene preaching a message no one had ever heard before. 
He comes on the scene out of the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. And he's out there screaming to the top of his voice. The anointing of God is so prominent on him that what he's preaching in the wilderness, they have to come out of the cities to come hear what he's talking about. And he's shouting, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That word repent means to change the way you think. Repentance is not confession. There are two different things. Confession of your sins is when you admit to a wrong or an error. You're confessing that. That's saying, Father, I missed it, and I, I just come before you. You saw it. You know what I did. That's confession. Repentance is a change of thinking. It is literally to be thinking this way and turn around and think that way. It means a redirection of your thought, almost like, like a 180. It's just a total opposite direction. And John comes on the scene and he says, everybody, you're going to have to start thinking this way. For the kingdom is here. Woo. He says a brand new revelation, a brand new manifestation of heaven is coming. And he was saying, I'm trying to prepare your mind because heaven is coming. <laughs> he said, you're going to have to change the way you've been thinking because there is a kingdom from heaven that is coming. And then Jesus shows up on the scene and says, I'm it. And then Jesus began to preach the first words out of his mouth out of, out, after he comes out of the Jordan, comes through the wilderness, the first words out of his mouth are repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, my God. John says you're going to have to change the way you're thinking for the kingdom is coming. Jesus shows up and says it's here now. And you're going to have to change the way you're thinking. Why is that? Because this is the way the kingdom advances. Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse number 12, for the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. Boy, y'all are so good with these screens, I tell you. Y'all need to train other ministries how to do this. <laughs> now, that, that's a little obscure when you read it that way. If you read it in other translations, it gives you a better understanding of what it is saying. It is saying from the days of John the Baptist, from the moment John showed up, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing. Okay. It, it, means it, 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 it means that John showed up with a revelation that the kingdom is coming. And at that moment, the kingdom began to push its way into the earth realm. And then the Bible says, and the violent seized it. Why am I saying that this morning? Because that's the way the kingdom advances. Whenever God gets ready to advance the kingdom, he sends a revelation. And then people have to press into it. And I believe I was sent here to echo with Peter and Tricia the kingdom revelation and the kingdom word that God is trying to bring the church into. Because I can tell you prophetically where we're headed. We are headed into sonship. 
That's where the body of Christ is going. God has been growing us and growing us and growing us and growing us. And the end time message and manifestation will be that of sonship. 1997, I found myself at the revival at TBN in Nashville. And I stood up in 1997 and I said, where the church is going is into the revelation of the kingdom of heaven. This was 1997, over 20, what was that, 26, um, 25 years ago. And when I said that, and the people began to write to me all over the nation and around the world, what is this kingdom stuff you're talking about? What is this kingdom stuff? Kingdom stuff. Well, now everybody knows it's kingdom stuff. And it's not to say anything about me. Many other people were preaching it. It's just that you kind of caught where heaven was trying to take the church. And, and so we had to repent because a revelation was coming. Because we were stuck in church. When God was trying to get us out the church and into the world. So the revelation of the kingdom came and then men were raised up like Lance Wall now and all these other men of God preaching about the seven mountains and how we've got to get into the mountains because the kingdom is not in the church. <laughs> the church is actually a part of the kingdom. The kingdom supersedes the church. And Satan was just real happy to get us stuck in these four walls. But when we start breaking out, saying we're coming to business and education and we're coming everywhere to subdue every other mountain underneath the authority of the kingdom. That's the age we are in right now. It is a kingdom age. But now let me tell you what has to happen to us. If we don't get our identity right, we will never function in our authority. In other words, you will never release what's in you until you get a revelation of who you are. And so this is where the body of Christ is coming. This is where we're going. This is, you're going to hear more people being raised up, raised up, raised up, talking about who we are, what we have, sonship. We're going to move into this thing. And so what happened last night, most of you have heard those revelations. Some of you heard it for the first time. Some of you heard it in a way you never heard it. Because heaven is trying to advance the kingdom here. And he brought a revelation to you so that now you can take it by force. In other words, now we got to move into it. We got to move into it. And so he brings a revelation and then he finds a people that will move into that revelation. That's how the kingdom advances. That how it, that's how it advances in your life individually. God moves you into a revelation and then you got to press into it. And then he moves you to another revelation and then you got to press into it. Then he gives you another revelation and you got to press into it. So he moves you from revelation to revelation. That's why the Bible declares that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's how God moves your life along is he gives you a word and then he gives you another word and then he gives you another word and then when you look up at the end of your life it is just a sum total of the revelations that God gave you that moved you from point A to point B. Boy this is apostolic stuff this morning. I, I don't know how I got on all this. And so, and so what he's trying to do now is shift this whole region into another dimension of the kingdom. 
is trying to move you into a higher dimension. And so now let's press deeper. Let's seize this revelation. Last night we talked about the resurrection and how there needed to be further revelation about the resurrection. That the resurrection was not just about a man physically coming out of the grave. Many people had come out of the grave physically. We talked about the widow of Zarephath. You remember Elijah came, Elijah came and said, make me a cake first. And then they did that. But after that, the son died. Elijah took the son, laid him on his bed, stretched himself out three times over the boy. And the Bible says, and he revived. And then Elisha, that was Elijah. Then Elisha with the Shunammite woman, they built him a place to stay. And then after that, her son died. And she said, man of God, why are you playing with me? I didn't ask for a son. You remember she was the one that the, that, the, that the servant asked, what can be done for her? She doesn't have a child. Elisha says, by this time next year, you're going to have a son. And by that time next year, she had a son. But then the son died, and the woman had an attitude. She said, I didn't ask for one. You prophesied one, gave him to me, and then he died. Elisha came, stretched himself out over the boy. The boy sneezed seven times and came back to life. Many people had come back from the dead physically. But why is Jesus called the firstborn from the dead? Last night you got the revelation. It is because he was the firstborn from the dead spiritually. That the resurrection of Jesus was a spiritual resurrection. He was resurrected before he ever picked up his body. <laughs> ah, glory to God yes he was resurrected before he went back up through the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea picked up his body and came out and so his body was resurrected I want you to I want to be clear it was resurrected a glorified body Matter of fact, his body was so resurrected that once he was resurrected, both spiritually and physically, he just walked through the wall. <laughs> he, he, just, he just walked right on through the wall because he was in a resurrected dimension. But the emphasis on the resurrection is not on the physical side because many had came back to life physically. But what Jesus did was conquer death. He conquered it in the spirit because Adam cursed us all to death. So I want you to look at a couple of verses and then we're going to go deeper into this because I'm really trying to get you to authority. But you got to go through resurrection in order to get to ascension. So I want you to look at a couple of verses and then we'll, we'll tie this up and then we'll go deeper. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and I want you to look at verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Or you can probably just watch the screen because it'll be up there in five, four, three, two. <laughs> I, told, I told you, they're, they're good here. <laughs> it says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. See, now all of this makes sense when you understand that Jesus coming from the dead, being the firstborn from the dead, you now understand that. Matter of fact, go to Colossians chapter number one, verse number 18, and it'll be up there. Colossians 1:18. It says, and he is the head 
of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, the reason Paul said we've got to have this revelation is because it was the resurrection from the dead that gave Jesus the preeminence over everything. And it was because he alone paid the price for spiritual death and when God resurrected him he says now all belongs to you why because he was the first spirit raised from the dead but then we found out last night the only reason he did that is so that he could raise your spirit from the dead I want you to go to John chapter number three, and you're going to see something in a way you've never seen it before. And one of the, the uh, I, I think uh, Tricia or somebody prophesied it here just a, a little bit ago, how God was going to teach us how to walk in this. Somebody said it. It might have been one of the worship leaders. My God, they were just amazing. John chapter number three, Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, who, who can never let it be known that he was out there talking to Jesus. That's why he had to come by night. He was so mesmerized at watching Jesus until he said, nobody can do what you do except you come from God. I have to admit it. Nicodemus said, I can't endorse your ministry. My brethren can never know I'm out here talking to you. But what is it about you? We know you come from God. Nobody can do the things you do except God be with you. Nicodemus is saying, what? What, 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 what are you? What, who are you? And then Jesus takes him out to the deep end of the pool and just drops him in the water and he says verily verily I say unto you except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom he's saying Nicodemus you cannot understand me because you are not in a spiritual dimension you don't have capacity to understand me yet because you are not born again until you are born again there are certain things you can't even see you can't even perceive you can't even receive there are certain things you cannot even get revelation of and then Nicodemus says now wait a minute you're messing with my head he, he says how can one be born when he is old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then Jesus, going to the next verse, Jesus said, Nick, Nick, Nick. <laughs> he, he, says, he says, I'm not talking about a natural birth. Except the man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Woo. Next verse, he says, for that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. What Jesus came to bring is a rebirth of your spirit. This is what I wish they would have told me 40 years ago. That to be born again is literally the resurrection of my spirit. That my spirit man literally was born again. It was revived. It was resurrected. And Jesus paid the price for that. 
for the resurrection of your spirit. Now that you understand this dimension, I want, I want to take you deeper into something and then we'll see where it goes. So now, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. If you read the Apostle Paul's teachings, you will read scriptures where he talks to himself about himself. As if he is not himself. In other words, he talks to himself like they're different parts of him. He talks to himself like he's a spirit being. And then he talks to himself like he has a body. Then he talks to himself like his mind is subjected to his spirit. Why does Paul have this revelation? Because in Galatians, I always say this, when I get to heaven, there are three people I want to see. There are three people I want to see. The first person I'm going to run up to when I get to heaven, it ain't Jesus. Jesus number two. I'm going to Adam. It's just a joke for those that are watching. It's just, it's just a joke. I'm going to be, how could you? Over a fruit? You lost the glory of God over a pear? Or a peach or a plum or apple? A fig? How could you fall for that? Then I'm going to go to Jesus and I'm going to bow down at his feet and tell him thank you. And then I'm going to go hang out with Paul. <laughs> when we all get to heaven, it's just going to be me and Paul <laughs> hanging out in a corner somewhere just talking all the time. You're going to be trying to get to him and I'm going to be, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> because Paul... Paul said in Galatians chapter number one, matter of fact, uh, since y'all are so good with the screens, just, just put Galatians chapter number one up on the screen. And I want you, I want you to look at, at verse number, ah, uh, yes, look at verse number 11. Galatians 1, 11, 12. I, oh, I've been sharing this message. I preached it about five or six times, and I always have to go here because Paul says, I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which I preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul says, brethren, what you've heard me preach, I didn't get it from man. I wasn't taught it by man. But Paul later on goes down to say, but when it pleased God who called me from my mother's womb to reveal his son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul says, these things that I'm telling you about Christ, about the resurrection, about these things, about redemption. He says, nobody taught that to me. He says, I didn't get that from the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. I got all of that by revelation. Oh, my God. This is why Paul says, I got so much revelation. There were things that, that I couldn't even talk about. 
He says in Corinthians, I mean, I, I mean, good. And I was caught up and I was in the third heavens, second heavens. Uh, I, there were things I couldn't even utter. He said, God opened up my spirit and showed me so much stuff I can't even talk about. And Paul says he did it all by just download. He says, I didn't learn it. I didn't go to school for it. I was persecuting the church. I couldn't stand the church. I held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. But on my way to Damascus, he knocked me off my beast. And then set me aside to give me a revelation that even Peter, James, and John didn't know. What was the revelation? What is the gospel? It is the fact that Jesus' spirit was raised from the dead. It was Paul that got that revelation. And then brought it to the body of Christ. Therefore, Paul was the first one to reveal to us that this is about a spiritual dimension. Put your hand on yourself and say, this is about a spiritual dimension. That the work of Jesus Christ in my life all happens in my spirit. Nothing changes with my eyes, my eye color, my nose, my hair. None of that changes. All that's going to change one day, that's when you get your glorified body. But that's not what changed in you. What changed was the operation that took place in your spirit. That your spirit literally was resurrected. Do you know what that means? That means there is no death in you. That the born again experience, the resurrection of your spirit was literally the removal of all sin and death out of it. There is literally no sin in you. I know what your question is, then what's wrong with me then? <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> I got to get you to think this because ever since the Lord has been dealing with me about this, my wife has received a better husband. Because I'm learning to compartmentalize myself. So now let's deal with this spiritual dimension because when Adam died, sin now became the nature of our spirits. This is why we needed it resurrected. This is why it had to be born again. Because out of our spirits came death and every manifestation with it. Out of our spirits came lying and stealing. And in other words, when Adam sinned, his spirit died, which means I told you spiritual death is the removal of God's image his essence out of it he was still a spirit being he was just a dead man walking he was still spirit but his spirit was separated from God estranged from God and literally what Adam contracted was the nature of Satan because he was originally 
the first dead spirit. <laughs> That's what happened to him. When God kicked him out, he stripped him of any authority. He stripped him of the anointing that was on his life. And Satan literally lost his mind. This is why he's so twisted and perverted. That's why everything about him is in the polar opposite direction of God. He is diametrically opposed. If God is love, now he's hate. If God, you understand what I'm saying? Because he has lost to his nature. He's a dead spirit. That's what he is. And when Adam sinned, he joined the company of the dead. And then cursed us all into spiritual death. No matter who was born, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the way down from Noah. You remember when God destroyed the planet? Wiped it out. Said, man, is so evil. This is not my plan for them. Wiped the whole planet and started over with Noah. And the moment Noah got off the boat, what did he do? He ended up drunk. And naked in a tent. Why? Because the nature of sin was cursed upon all humanity. It was in us to lie, to steal. Our spirit, all of that was spiritual death. Jesus comes on the scene. And when you get born again, your spirit literally goes through a new creation. These are not just words. These are things that happen. Your spirit is recreated. It goes through a reviving and a resurrection. And all that we contracted in Adam, all our spirits contracted, was literally removed out of it. And God didn't take another spirit to replace yours with he took the same spirit that was in Jesus and recreated yours with it this is why the Bible says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies Listen, child of God, you didn't get some type of knockoff brand spirit. You didn't get some kind of generic spirit. You got the same spiritual resurrection that Jesus got. Oh, put your hand on your head and say, oh, God, help me. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. This is why the Bible says, and he raised us up together. You went through the same resurrection if you have been born again. Your spirit went through the exact same process. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus' spirit from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that raised yours from the dead. And as you sit there this morning, your spirit man has the same image as Christ. Look at your neighbor say, boy, if you could see me, if you could really see me, if you could see me, if you could see what I look like, if you could see past the clothes and past the skin, past the jeans, if you could see what I look like. This is the mystery, yeah. This is what was hidden 
from Satan. This is the master plan of God. That since Adam sinned, nobody knew how God was going to get his race back. This was the mystery. And had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified him. If they would have known that a resurrection of spirits were coming, they would have never crucified him. They would have never killed him. They would have never allowed him to die, but they didn't know it. They thought this was physical. It wasn't. It wasn't until Jesus was resurrected that your Bible declares the manifold wisdom of God was revealed to principalities and powers. Your Bible declares that nobody knew what was coming. Satan didn't know it. And when Jesus was resurrected, God says, now the mystery can now be revealed of what I've been working on since Adam sinned. I'm about to reveal something to principalities and powers. What is it you're going to reveal to them, Jesus? I am about to resurrect spirits. And this was the mystery that nobody knew was coming. So would you go to, go to Colossians chapter number one, verse number 26, if you would. And then maybe we can start to get to this authority I've been talking about. Yes, yes, Colossians 1, 26, even the mystery which had been hidden from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, which is, here's the mystery, which is, which is, which is, which is, which is Christ Did you just read what that said? It said that the mystery that God had been hiding from ages and generations wasn't just how God was going to get in Christ. The real mystery is how he was going to get Christ in you. <laughs> Which means Jesus says, I wasn't even the mystery. It would have been enough if Jesus was the mystery. Someone born of God who would then die a sinner and then be resurrected back from the dead. That would be enough. But he said that wasn't the mystery. The real mystery is how I was going to get that resurrection into you. Put your hands on yourself and say, I'm the mystery. I'm the mystery. I'm the mystery. That same spirit in me was the mystery. That's what God hid from all ages. Is how he was going to get Christ in you. And remember me talking about this duality of this exchange between heaven and earth. That while we are celebrating Christ, Christ is down here celebrating us. While we are worshiping God and saying, you're our great father. What a good, good father you are. He's up in heaven saying, and this is my beloved son. It's too early in the morning to get drunk. I mean spiritually. I mean spiritually. <laughs> Somebody shout, he's in me. 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 
And that's what God wanted to reveal to manifold principalities and powers. It's not only will you have to deal with one of me. You are about to have to deal and if we really ever understand who we are. How did he get that accomplished? By the resurrection from the dead. That Jesus was not the only one. He was the first born now you and I can be born again. Come on, lay your hands on your head and say, I receive it. And the moment you got born again, I got born again August the 20th, 1988. I was sitting on my mother's couch in the living room. And I said, God, if you're really real, change me. Something happened to me that day. But I didn't know what happened to me. But I knew I was changed. From that day forward, I left the world, I left sin, I left cursing, I left all of that. A lifestyle of fornication, I left all of that. Can you believe it? I used to rap a little bit. I left, I left all, all of that. I left it all and I've never looked back because something happened to me that day. And I didn't know what it was, but now I know what happened. Sitting right there in my mother's living room, my spirit was raised from the dead. I was resurrected. Something happened to me. That's why I couldn't do what I used to do. That's why I couldn't go back to the clubs. That's why I couldn't do it. Something happened to me. And it took me these last 30 some years to figure out what exactly happened to me. My spirit was raised from the dead. Whew. Oh, they okay. I, I, I preach right through all of that. <laughs> Come on, we want the glory and when the glory shows up, we just got to let God do what he's got to do. Oh, shout glory, 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 glory. We are a resurrected generation. Ha! Oh, my God. See my mama ball kissed. This, this is the revelation that Paul says, I pray that you understand what happened with the resurrection. Now, 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 you and I have to learn how to walk in the spirit. Now you understand Galatians 5. When Paul says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because now there is no more death or sin in your spirit. Matter of fact, be before I close this down, let me just talk about that for a minute. When your spirit got resurrected, 
sin nature was obliterated in you. Your spirit has no desire for sin. <laughs> Your spirit has now received the very nature of Jesus. There is absolutely no fear in your spirit. She said it just a moment ago. God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. Peter just said it, but of power, love, which means whenever you feel fear, it is not coming from your spirit. Your spirit has no fear in it. The thing has been resurrected. There is no doubt in your spirit. This is why God makes you walk by faith. All God is telling you is that if you're going to walk with me, you're going to have to walk by your spirit. I'm not going to let you use your mind. I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. He says, I'm not going to let you use your emotions to walk with me. I'm going to make you walk with me in the dimension that I raised from the dead, which is your spirit. That is the real you. That is what has been raised from the dead. And it doesn't just have love in it. It has the love of God in it. Which means you can love your enemies. <laughs> there is no pride in your spirit. All that was obliterated when you were raised from the dead. There is no anxiety, there is no hate, there is nothing. The only thing in your spirit is the nature of God. See, this is crucial that you learn this because, because you think to be like Jesus that you're just going to be walking across your swimming pool. <laughs> you think you're going to live all day long just in a cloud, in a mist. Jesus didn't even do that. You have to understand that there will be dimensions of you that will walk in the power of the Spirit. But when you're not walking in the power of the Spirit, you have to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Which means, just a moment, which means, which means there will be moments that you will be walking in supernatural demonstration. We'll get to that. Oh, that's where I'm trying to get to. But what do you do when you're not working miracles, when you're not prophesying? What do you do when you're not healing the sick? Here's what you do. You walk in love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness. It's amazing because sometimes when I'm preaching, as you can tell, I can get pretty animated. Sometimes I can really go out there, you know, jumping over pews. And... But I don't determine that. The anointing determines that. But people who know me, they'll always ask my wife, like, you know, when I'm preaching, Mostly when people pick me up from airports and things like that, and they uh, we go out to eat and all that, they'll be like, he, he's different. 
than he is when he's free because they expect my personality to be like, hey, where are we going today? What are we? You know, they expect me to, to be wild, but, but that's under the anointing. When I'm not under the anointing of the Spirit, then I function by the fruit of the Spirit. Which means I just want to be peace somewhere going to happen. I don't panic over anything. Matter of fact, the worse the situation is, the calmer I get. I don't take any credit for it. Trust me. It's just that I've learned how to walk in my spirit. So when tragedy hits, I don't flip out. I go inside and I start saying, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? How do you want me to strong? What's the revelation? I know there's a way out of this. What's the wisdom? Give me wisdom and revelation. And instead of panicking about the problem, I'm waiting to hear the answer, the solution, because there is not a problem that can happen in this life. That the wisdom of God doesn't have the key to unlock. But in order to get it, you got to go in your spirit. You got you to gotta hear from your spirit. Because the love of God is in there. That's why you can't get me offended. This is why I love everybody. I love everybody, everybody. And people try to get me to hate. They try to get me to hate, boy. But I can't do it. I tried it. It won't work. I tried it. I tried it. People even ask me, you know, they try to get me stirred up about racial stuff, and I can't even do it. I just can't even do it. I, I can't even do it. Well, well, what, what do you think about the Klan? They need Jesus. I mean, I mean, that's the way I see it. I, 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 I'm not. I need, they need to be saved. They need. They need their spirits resurrected. I, I'm not mad at racists. I pray for racists. See, the church can't even handle it. They, they can't. I, I do what Jesus said, and here's what Jesus said. He says, love those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully misuse you. So the next time you hear somebody put out a rumor on you, pray for them. Because it has been said, no, eye for an eye, the two for two. I got to tell them a piece of my mind. I got to call them up and say, why did you say that about me? I got to confront them. I've got to come against them. I've got to curse them out. I got to let them know who I am. That's the way dead people act. But people whose spirits have been resurrected... You don't chase down rumors. You don't care about what people said about you. It has no bearing whatsoever. Who cares whether they're talking about you? Peter and I were talking in the back because we, we, we were talking when you preach as much as we do, you say things all of the time. I mean, I mean, you'll say like when Moses was in the fiery furnace. How many of you know Moses wasn't in the fiery furnace? <laughs> Your mind is going at the speed of light, and sometimes we say things. We quote wrong scriptures. We, we put the wrong people in the wrong passages. We say all kinds of stuff. And we were talking about when, when uh, uh, someone wrote me and said, wait a minute, you said something that doesn't make sense, and, and, they, it, and it confused them because I said it wrong. And they wrote me about it, and I wrote them back. I say, oh, thank you for pointing that out to me. I'm glad you said that. I simply misspoke on that issue. You're actually right, and I was wrong about it. The person wrote me back and said, I can't, I can't believe this. <laughs> he said, I have more respect for you 
He says, now I know why God uses you. Like he uses you. Because it's a weird thing, I guess, to watch people be humble. Or preachers be humble, yeah. <laughs> That's not supposed, when you're resurrected, you, you get pleasure in manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. You get pleasure at forgiving people. <laughs> Come on, it'll, it'll become more and more. <laughs> yeah, so the next time you're in, a, you're in a situation where somebody has done you wrong, forgive them. Let it go. Let it go. Vengeance is mine, Seth. Let God sort it out. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know, right wrongs and make sure things are done and we shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't hold people accountable. That's not what I'm saying. But it's got to be done from a spirit of love. That's why the Bible says even when you speak the truth, you have to speak the truth in love. Which means everything must be done from a spiritual nature. Oh, my God, I can see it now. I can see it now. Husbands and wives walking around the house saying, that ain't no resurrected spirit right there. You, you. Oh, yeah, I just messed up everything in your house. I just messed up everything. The next time you're about to fly off, something's going to come up in you and say, that ain't the way a resurrected spirit handles and instead of flying off, you will say, come, let us reason together. <laughs> Sit down, dear. This is what I meant by that. This is, I don't know why I'm teaching this this morning. <laughs> See, you got to learn how now to walk like you resurrected. Now. If my spirit has been resurrected, oh my God, if I have been raised from the dead, if death has been removed out of my spirit, if sin has been removed out of my spirit, then why do I still struggle? It is because your mind and your body were trained under a dead spirit. So we thought dead. Our emotions of fear and anxiety and anger and Passions in our body of lust. I heard Trisha talking about God can deliver you from fornication and, and pornography and all of those things. Now you know why. Because the residue of death is still in my body. My spirit was resurrected, but not my mind. It has to be renewed. Which means my real enemy now. Is my mind. It is my will. Somebody got up and prophesied about that. That God wants your will. Why? Because even though you have been raised from the dead, the way you used to think, the way you used to feel, the way we've been educated, the things we've learned, the things we've been taught, the things we were raised in, certain things in our body generationally. Some of us were born with, with weaknesses in our physical bodies, the appetites of lust and perversion. 
And it doesn't have to be just lust for men and women. It can be lust for Krispy Kreme. you notice you never get a craving for some broccoli <laughs> haven't you noticed that haven't you noticed you ain't ever woke up in the morning and said I just got to have some kale I just I just I just got to have some carrots and just gotta have it And so the thing that stops us from walking in this spiritual dimension are things that were trained in us. Fear and timidity and all of those things now have become enemies to our spirit nature. But have you ever had a moment were your spirit, soul, and body aligned with something? Where the moment God spoke it to you, your mind didn't fight it. And you felt the surge of the anointing flow through your body. It is in those moments you feel, you just feel invincible. Like you can do anything. That's why you have to keep coming to church. Because most of those synergized moments happen when we're in the presence of God together. That's why when we get together, there's a corporate anointing. That's why you can walk in that building and feel defeated. But you get in under the worship and under the corporate anointing. And all of a sudden, you have faith start rising in you. And hope start rising in you because we're all spirit beings and we have the ability to infect one another with our atmospheres you need to touch somebody and say that's why to sit next to me you gotta be spiritual you gotta be spiritual you got to be spiritual. I got to be able to pick you up in the Wi-Fi. I got to be able to sense you. And when we get together, all of our resurrected spirits functioning in faith and hope and love, and then the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes, there ain't a devil in hell we can't take down. So this morning we cry with the Apostle Paul when he says in Philippians 3, Oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. We have got to now plumb the length, the width, the depth, and the heights of knowing how to walk in a spiritual dimension. Where you can look at any situation and you can say, okay, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. See, all those scriptures will make sense to you because what he's talking about is through the nature that he gave me, I can do it. You do understand when the Bible talks about Christ in you, what he's talking about. Physically, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. So how is he in you if he's at the right hand of the Father? Because this is spiritual. He said in John 17, I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave something with you. My peace I'm going to leave with you. My joy, I'm going to give it to you. He's talking about the resurrection of your spirit. He's talking about how literally I'm going to put myself in you when you are born again. Can I have 
Can I have three people? Can I, can I have you? Can I have you? Can I have you? Let me, can, can you come up here? Can I borrow you? Yes. I want you all to stand in a line facing that way. You get behind him and you get behind him. Okay. This is what happens. Through Adam, you contracted spiritual death. And so the, the dead spirit of Adam, the Adamic nature, produced your spirit trained you in fear trained you in sin satan became your master because he has authority over you through spiritual death this is why god stripped him of his power over your life by raising your spirit from the dead because if he can't control your spirit he ain't got no business controlling your life we'll move into that in the next session and so you were trained, 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 trained. And then Jesus comes and says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation and takes this nature out of you. And he doesn't replace it with another nature. He replaces it with his nature. You didn't get another spirit. You got his. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Do you, you got his. His is in you. His nature is is in you that's why the bible says he is the firstborn now among many brethren now are we the sons of god it does not yet appear what we shall be but right now all of us have the same identity which means if you are to hold up jesus spirit and then put your spirit right beside it. They are identical twins. So now what you've got to do is learn how to let that nature dominate you. Now... You've got to learn the capacity of how to walk in that. Do you know you have the kind of peace that is in you that goes to sleep in a storm? <laughs> did, you, did you remember Jesus' response to the storm beating a boat? Just knocking everything around the disciples screaming in Jesus sleep <laughs> so the next time all hell breaks out in your life and your family is asking what are we going to do you're going to tell them I'm going to bed Why am I up all night worrying about this when I've already got a promise? You didn't hear what I said. That no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Matter of fact, some of this stuff, uh-oh, that you're praying about, it ain't prayer at all. Some of your prayers are panic. Some of your prayers are 911 calls. They ain't full of faith at all. Because if you really had faith, God would say, why are you wasting time praying to me about this? I've already told you. I'm going to supply all your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So you don't have to pray for that. Go to bed. Oh, I like the way you shout now. The 
that's the kind of peace that's in your spirit. That's in my spirit. My wife is sitting right here on the front row. She will tell you that we try to live this every day. Because when all hell breaks loose, there will be two reactions. Your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, and your spirit. Which one are you going to follow? When you don't know what to do, don't ever say you don't know what to do. Because the wisdom of God is in your spirit. It's in you. The answer is in there. You just got to steal your mind. Get still. Panic out. Get the emotions. Go on a fast until you can hear the wisdom of God come out of you. This morning, my assignment was to get you to understand the spiritual dimension that you live in. And you can switch just like that. Just like that. The moment somebody says something to you and you feel that thing starting to come up in you, whereas they say it rubbed you the wrong way. Just like that, you can say, I ain't responding to that. You're teaching yourself how to walk in the spirit and how to bring your mind into to subjection underneath your nature. When God opens a door for me, there was a, there was a moment where God opened a door for me and, and it was in a, a realm, you know, I love preaching and revelation. I don't like talking about a whole lot of other stuff, but God opened the door. And for the first time in a long time, when I, when I knew I was going to have to be a part of this assignment, I felt anxiety. Normally, I don't have that. I'm full of confidence, not arrogance, confidence. That's, that's in your spirit. That's a part of your spirit's nature. And I started to feel anxiety. And for the first time in a long time, I started like, what in the world am I doing here? I can't, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And I was able to tap into that spirit dimension and say, what's wrong with you? And I was sitting right there on the stage talking and people didn't know that while I was talking to them, I was having a conversation with myself on the inside saying, turn it loose, turn it loose, turn it loose. You were born for this. You were anointed for this. Open up your mouth and speak like the oracle of God. And I was just smiling and talking to people and talking to people and talking to people. And on the inside, I was telling my soul, shut up, shut up, shut up. Telling my emotions, shut up, shut up, shut up. I don't have no fear in me. God has not given me a spirit of fear. I'm not timid about nothing. Whatever God has called me to do, I'm well able to do it. I'm anointed. I am equipped. And everything I don't know, the Holy Ghost has got nine gifts of the Spirit so he can show it to me and tell it to me. And I'm telling you, by the time I got done, I felt like a giant. Why? Because your spirit has been raised from the dead. So now my assignment is to bring your mind out. Now I have to think like I'm resurrected. I have to speak like I'm resurrected. I have to act like I'm resurrected. I have to live like I'm resurrected. Did you receive anything this morning? Did you get revelation and understanding? Stand up on your feet. I want to pray over you. 
Glory be to God. Now, when you come back in a few minutes, is it 12 o'clock for real? Oh, we started at 9.30. Okay, I'm thinking we started at 9. Okay. Um, when you come back, all of that's resurrection. That ain't my assignment this weekend. <laughs> my assignment is ascension. When you come back in this room, you get ready to be taken into a dimension that you have never been taken into. But until you understand the resurrection, you won't walk in the ascension. And so, Father, let this word remain in us that we will live, speak, and act like resurrected spirits that you have raised from the dead. Now lift your hands and thank Jesus for raising you from the dead. Thank you, Jesus.